Hey friends, in this chapter we'll talk about states of matter, how we can have atoms or molecules that will arrange themselves in such a way as to make solids or liquids or even gases. So stick around. In this first section, we're going to focus our thoughts mostly on gases. We're going to talk about how those particles differ from solids and liquids. Let's talk about the nature of gases for a moment. We know, first of all, that gases expand to fill their containers. We learned that way back in the beginning of chemistry. Like liquids, gases have flow, so therefore they are fluid in that sense. In contrast to solids and liquids, gases have very low density. On average, they have about 1 1,000th the density of an equivalent liquid or solid. Gases are compressible. You can compress a large volume of gas into a small cylinder because of all that empty space between particles. Gases also have the ability to diffuse. You can have one gas that mixes into another gas very readily. Gases also effuse. Now, let me explain the difference between the two. Whereas with diffusion, one gas is blending into another in open space, with effusion, you have a concentration of gas moving from a high concentration to a low concentration or a vacuum through a small hole. Another thing that sets gases apart from solids or liquids is the high amount of kinetic energy their particles have. This idea of particles having kinetic energy gives us what we call the kinetic molecular theory, or KMT for short. Kinetic having everything to do with motion. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. Here are some of the principles or assumptions that we make with our kinetic molecular theory. For one, particles of gases have constant random motion. They don't change that direction unless they run into something. The volume of each individual gas particle is assumed to be next to nothing, almost zero. That's going to make more sense later on when we talk about gas laws. When those particles run into something else, and they will, whether it's the walls of the container or another particle, those collisions are what we call elastic collisions. That is to say, there's no real kinetic energy lost in that collision process. Because of the speed at which they're passing one another, those gas particles don't really exert an attractive force or a repulsive force on one another. By the way, the average kinetic energy of the particles of that gas, it's proportional to the Kelvin temperature of that gas. Cool, huh? Let's talk about kinetic energy for a moment. First, it's important to understand at the same conditions of temperature, all gases have the same average kinetic energy. To calculate kinetic energy, we use this equation. Kinetic energy, or Ke, equals one-half times the mass times the velocity of that particle squared. What we can derive from this is that at the same temperature, small molecules or small particles move faster than larger ones do. Or we can put it this way. The rate of motion is proportional to 1 over the square root of the mass. In other words, there's an inverse relationship between mass and the rate of motion. The larger the particle, the smaller it goes. You can remember this by thinking of a speedboat versus a cruise ship. The speedboat is small but fast. The cruise ship, very large but slow. We described before that diffusion is when you have gases that mix together. The rate of diffusion is the rate of those gases mixing. The way that diffusion happens, though, is a result of random motion of those gas particles. For instance, if I have one particle moving this way and one moving this way, and they collide, it's going to cause a change in direction for both of those particles. And remember, these particles move in such a way as to cause that gas to fill the whole room. These collisions cause changes in direction, which is how diffusion happens. When you get enough collisions, those particles move to fill the entire space. Now, if you increase the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy. So those particles are moving faster. So an increase in temperature increases the rate of diffusion. And as we said before, small molecules are going to diffuse faster than large ones will. We can compare the diffusion or even the effusion of two gases using Graham's Law. Graham's Law works like this. If you want to compare the rate of one gas to another gas, the rate of the first gas, we'll call it A, over the rate of the second gas, we'll call it B, is equal to the square root of 
the molar mass of gas B over the molar mass of gas A. You get that? It's kind of a crisscross thing happening in there. Let's use Graham's Law to compare hydrogen gas and radon gas. Now, we know that hydrogen is a lot smaller than radon, but how much faster is it? Well, the rate of hydrogen gas compared to the rate of radon gas is equal to the square root of the mass of radon, 222 grams per mole, divided by the mass of hydrogen gas. Remember, H2, 2.02 grams per mole. When we do the math, we get 10.5. What that means is hydrogen is 10.5 times faster at diffusing or effusing than radon gas is. Here's a problem for you to do. See if you can find the molar mass of a gas that's three times slower than helium. You're not identifying the gas, you're just finding the number, the molar mass of that gas. Here's a hint for you. If the unknown is slower, that means it's one-third the speed of helium. So, this setup may help you just a little bit. When you find the amount for the molar mass, just put your answer in the LMS. Have you ever wondered how you can have a really big person wearing cowboy boots to walk across a hardwood floor and not dent the floor, but then you could have a much smaller person wearing stiletto high heels and they'll put dents all over that hardwood floor? Why is that? It has to do with pressure. We define pressure as force per unit area. So the person wearing cowboy boots is spreading that force across a much wider area than the stiletto high heel. The heel of the boot is much larger than the stiletto. So the person wearing the stiletto is putting their force in a very small, compact area. That means a greater amount of pressure in that one little spot. Gas particles also put pressure on the walls of their container. Every time they hit the wall of their container, they're exerting a force on that container wall. A force on a particular unit of area. The more times they collide with that... Oh, the more times they collide with that container wall... The more times they collide with that container... The more times... Okay. The more times they collide with that container wall, the greater the pressure. Collisions equals pressure. Human beings are designed to live in a pressurized environment. We have air molecules all around us, colliding with our bodies and putting pressure on them. If we went into outer space without a spacesuit, the absence of those air particles bombarding against us would cause us great bodily harm. So Earth is surrounded by an atmosphere that extends into space for really hundreds of kilometers. Since the particles of air move in every direction, they exert pressure in every direction. Naturally, because gravity is stronger the closer you get to the center of the Earth, the air particles are more dense near the surface of the Earth. At higher altitudes, you have less gravity and therefore less air particles, which means less air pressure. The first guy to figure this out lived back in the 17th century. His name was Evangelista Torricelli. Torricelli noticed one day that water pumps were unable to pump water past a height of around 10 meters, or 32 feet. He made a hypothesis that the height of the column of liquid would vary based on the density of the liquid. So he performed an experiment where he had a thin glass tube. In that glass tube, he put mercury. He filled the tube all the way up. While holding that tube closed, he inverted the tube and submerged the open end of the tube in a pool of mercury. The mercury inside the tube fell to a height of about 76 centimeters, or 760 millimeters. And Torricelli found that the height of that mercury was always around 760 millimeters. A little more sometimes, a little less other times. Torricelli had just invented the barometer. The barometer is able to measure atmospheric pressure for us. In the case of Torricelli's barometer, there were two forces at work. One was the gravity pulling downward on that mercury that's inside the tube. The other force was an upward force exerted by the air pressure pressing down on the surface of that pool of mercury, keeping the mercury inside the tube. So from day to day, when the atmospheric pressure may change a little bit, it may change the height of mercury in that tube. Obviously, things have changed a little bit from Torricelli's time. We no longer use big open pools of mercury to measure the atmospheric pressure. But nonetheless, the barometer helps us to know what the atmospheric pressure is from day to day. We can also measure the gas pressure inside a closed container using something called a manometer. In a manometer, you have a flask that's connected to a tube that's a U-shaped tube, and inside that U-shaped tube is mercury. When the valve to that flask is opened, the gas pressure inside will cause the mercury to move. 
the gas particles push down on the mercury on one side, causing the levels to change. So we can then calculate the pressure of the gas inside the flask based on the difference in the heights of mercury in that U-tube. Let's talk about units of pressure for a moment. The SI unit of pressure is the Pascal, or PA for short. The Pascal is derived from the SI unit for force, which is called the Newton, and the area would be a square meter. So one Pascal is equal to a Newton per square meter. We often use pounds per square inch in referring to the air in our tires for our vehicles. That's another way we can describe pressure. One of the easiest ways to report pressure is the atmosphere. We live in one atmosphere of pressure. One atmosphere is actually seen as the standard pressure. So therefore, one atmosphere of pressure is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury or 101.3 kilopascals. It's also equal to 14.7 pounds per square inch. Something else to note. Sometimes instead of seeing 760 millimeters of mercury, you'll see 760 tor. That's right. The unit was named in honor of Evangelista Torricelli. So a millimeter of mercury and a tor are interchangeable. One atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 tor. So these are the pressure units we'll be using. Again, one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, is equal to 101.3 kilopascals, is equal to 14.7 pounds per square inch. Whenever we want to make conversions from one to the other, it's pretty simple, like so. Let's say we have 0.5 atmospheres of pressure. How many tor would that be? All we do is use a conversion factor, 760 tor for every one atmosphere. And in this case, we'll multiply 0.5 times 760 to get 380 tor. So, 0.5 atmospheres is equal to 380 millimeters of mercury or 380 tor. If I'm going from tor back to atmospheres, I would simply divide by 760, wouldn't I? If I have a pressure of 1,520 tor and want to find out how many atmospheres that is, I'll simply divide by 760. So 1520 divided by 760 gives me two atmospheres of pressure. The last concept for this video is that of Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. Dalton found that each gas in a mixture of gases will exert pressure independently of the other gases present. Therefore, Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure states that the total pressure in a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the pressures of the individual gases. The portion of the total pressure that a single gas exerts is called a partial pressure. We can express it this way. The total pressure of a mixture of gas is equal to the pressure of gas 1 plus the pressure of gas 2 plus the pressure of gas 3. You get the idea. However many gases there are in that mixture, you just add their pressures together to get the total. Here's an example for you. Let's say we have a mixture of gases that has a total pressure of 0.97 atmospheres. In that mixture of gases, we have nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Let's say that the carbon dioxide has a partial pressure of 0.7 atmospheres, and the nitrogen has a partial pressure of 0.12 atmospheres. What is the partial pressure of the oxygen? It's really very simple. We'll take the total pressure and subtract the two pressures we know to find the remaining partial pressure of oxygen. So we have 0.97 minus 0.7 minus 0.12, leaving us with a partial pressure of 0.15 atmospheres for oxygen. You get it? That's the end of our video for today. In today's video, we began with a discussion of the characteristics of gases, and then that moved us into a discussion of kinetic molecular theory. We talked about the principles and assumptions we make with KMT. We moved on then to diffusion and effusion, what those mean for gases. Remember we said that the smaller the particle, the faster it moves. Speedboat, cruise ship, remember? That led us into a discussion of Graham's Law, where we can compare the rates of two gases based on their molar masses. Then we talked about pressure, how pressure is a result of the collisions of particles against the walls of their container. We described it as the force per unit area, and we mentioned several different types of units of pressure. Finally, we ended our time with Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. I hope this has been helpful to you, and if I can help you in any other way, please let me know. In our next video, we will talk about intermolecular forces. Until next time, God bless.